you so much for being here, everyone. Um, this is the Using Free IPAMS Data for International Health Research. Um, so we are all from IPAMS, and that is an organization with the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation at the University of Minnesota. Uh, my name is Devin Christensen. Uh, I'm the project manager of IPAMS PMA, and I'm here today uh, presenting with my colleagues, Miriam King, uh, Shula Sarkar, and Anna Volgren. Um, so first off, um, we're going to um, look over the schedule a little bit. Um, we know this is a pretty extensive um, workshop, so we wanted to give you a heads up about the flow of, um, of what we'll be presenting today. And we also will take some time for breaks and uh, multiple points for questions. Um, so at the very beginning, we're going to start um, with what is IPAMS generally, if you are not familiar with us. Um, from then on, Dr. Mir Miriam King will talk about IPAMS DHS uh, and a demonstration of one of our websites. Uh, we'll take a short break after that. Um, then I'll be uh, presenting uh, the project that I manage, IPAMS PMA, followed by uh, IPAMS newest project, IPAMS Mix with Anna Volgren. Um, after that will be um, a longer break with some time for Q&A at that point. Um, after that, uh, Shula Sarkar will demonstrate um, the online tabulator and talk a bit about IPAMS International. Um, at the conclusion of our um, workshop, we'll be talking about special features and value adds um, and different projects, and then wrap up with um, plenty of time for remaining questions. Um, so throughout the webinar, we have a Q&A feature enabled. Um, and that is different from the chat. Um, we might not see um, questions that are coming through the chat, we're, we'll, we will try, um, but we will definitely be monitoring the Q&A and someone will be typing responses, or um, we may choose to answer a few questions live during the, um, the Q&A breaks that we've um, enabled, but someone will be typing questions. Um, so, First things first, um, what is IPMS? Um, so IPMS stands for Integrated Public Use Microdata Series. Um, so IPMS is has been around for more than 25 years. Um, and it first got started with um, the PUMS, the Public Use Microdata Series was um, the public use version of the US Census data. Um, and so what integrated means, um, is that we have consistent codes, labels, and documentations, and also consistent variable names. Uh, public use means that it's free to download, um, anonymized. Uh, micro data means that we're talking about individual level data. We are not talking about tables. We have data on individual person records um, in fixed with files. Um, and then it's a series, so we've got data from across many years and across many countries. Um, so, um, like I said, we are based at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, um, and we are entirely grant funded. So um, access to our data is free. Uh, and I'll say it again, we truly do not charge for access to these data. Um, we consider ourselves a public good. Um, and then, so, like I mentioned, and I'll say this multiple times, we integrate data over time and place. Um, but another part of what, uh, what we do when we integrate is that we document and harmonize um, at the variable level. We have a systematic way of providing documentation, making it very available to users on our website. Um, and at a recent count, we had 1.4 billion persons uh, or records from over 750 census and surveys. So if you would go to our website, um, you'll see, you'll be greeted with this panel of different data collections. Um, so in addition to US and international census data, we also have survey data on um, labor force, time use, health interviews. Uh, we also have two aggregate data Projects, so that would be um, an HGIS and IHGIS. So I'm going to demonstrate what I mean when I say the IPAMS integration process. Um, 
So this process applies across all microdata, um, quick data collections at EVLAMS, and all of the projects that you'll be um, learning about today are all microdata projects from EVLAMS. So, um, like I said, we are all about making codes consistent and also making sure variable names are the same across time and place. Uh, we're also making sure that um, we're documenting comparability over time and making sure that the researcher knows and can access the documentation that we've done at the variable level. Um, and after, after this process, you're able to download, download a customized data file from our website. Um, and this can be in SPSS, Stata, SAS, uh, CSV, and fixed width. Um, we even have um, some capabilities to help you easily read data into R. So um, the goal of integration uh, is to make sure that, um, that you understand how to use the data effectively. Um, and, and one example I wanted to go th um, through about why the documentation is so important is if you, you wanna make sure you understand a variable's universe or um, the denominator that you're working with. Uh, for example, um, in the one of the um, major variables in the project that I manage is about a woman's, um, whether a woman is using modern contraceptives. And so um, a hypothetical example, we could say in one country in one year, um, the survey only asked women who were in union um, whether she was using um, a family planning method, and perhaps in other countries in years, they asked all women. So that, that first estimate of that one country is not comparable to the rest. And we definitely want to make sure researchers know that that is um, a quirk about that data so they can make sure to restrict the universe uh, and only look at married women when comparing to that particular country, for example. Um, so now I'm going to talk through um, a very high level, like how we integrate here at IPUMS. Um, so uh, this is an example from PMA. Um, we have um, these three countries um, from, you know, they have different educational systems. Um, this variable is about the highest level of education a woman had ever attended. Uh, and because of the different educational systems, um, these countries are going to have uh, their question um, categories look a little different and they'll be given different numbers. Um, but wow, uh, so this is what it comes to us from the original data producers. Um, and we are going to, for the sake of, um, you know, a good visual clarity, we're going to put into a table um, just so that we can make sure that we're treating categories that are comparable the same. Uh, and then on the left hand side, we're going to construct this, um, uh, this what's going to be the codes that you would download from our website, the, um, the integrated codes. So our work is in researching and making sure that um, we are uh, making sure that categories are comparable and we're also not losing any detail. Um, so it would not be comparable to put say, um, secondary two cycle with the secondary A level from Burkina Faso to Kenya. We wanna make sure researchers have the ability to keep those separate. Um, and then we're going to order and label everything appropriately. So we're going to use a composite coding scheme in which um, more general categories are going to be represented in the leftmost digits. So never attended is going to get a one for that leftmost digit. Primary will get a two. Uh, and for all of these countries in this example, um, never attended and primary school uh, appear to be comparable for this example. Uh, and then we're gonna go down through um, the different kind of high level groupings and give those a code. So you'll notice I've skipped five and that's just because in other PMA samples, there are some post-secondary vocational categories that we give a five to that grouping. Um, so as we move further in um, to the right, um, each of those codes are going to um, show some level of differentiation within the larger category, say, of secondary. We have cycle one, cycle two, and A level all have their, their second digit 
is a different number. So, um, and then um, the, the power of this is, is if you were looking for a more general comparison, for, for example, you, you were just looking to control for a larger category um, of education, just primary, secondary, tertiary, and never attended, um, you could just use the very first digit of this composite, uh, composite coding. Um, so that is um, what's going on behind the scenes. And what makes and what that makes possible is that we can download a microdata file in which we can have people records. So each of these rows is a person. Um, you're going to be able to pool uh, households from each of these samples uh, into one file, and then um, everything will be coded consistently. So um, the columns are going to be variable. So we have um, survey level identifiers, the household identifier, um, the urban or rural status of that household, uh, and then also the age of the individual on that, um, on that row. Um, so this way, um, everything will be consistent. And again, to, to really emphasize, we are not disseminating aggregate data with the, the projects we're talking about today. This is not um, you know, counts of, uh, of people by an age group or an income group. Um, we are disseminating um, individual level files. And that's really powerful and gives you a lot of flexibility in research. Okay, um, so at this point, uh, I, we wanted to um, send a little poll out um, because um, we wanted to see how, just how familiar people are with, um, with IPMS, uh, just to kind of fine tune our presentation. Um, so Anna, I think if you wouldn't mind taking that away. Here, let me launch the first of the poll questions. And it should be available for everyone to answer. And as people are answering, um, I, I would mention that um, we have a, a dedicated user support email, um, and that is also on the slide, but it's easy to find on uh, any of our websites. Um, the, uh, the team at the, the use support team at IPMS is they're familiar with all of our data projects. Uh, if there's a question that they don't know, um, they can very easily direct you to someone who does know the answer. If you're confused about something you see in our website, um, just looking for more clarification. Um, well, this is great. I'm seeing a lot of people who have used our data before. Excellent. And then uh, have there been any questions in the Q&A that have come up that um, might require a bit of discussion rather than a direct answer? Um, there have been a couple questions in the chat and chat is uh, pointing out that there is not an option to select no, never used IPMS data before. Oh. So <laughs> okay, that is an oversight on our part. Thank you for that. Um, we will <laughs> hold the poll open a little bit longer, but know that some of the people not participating are not current IPMS users, and hopefully we can change that at the end of this presentation. Excellent. I guess they're voting by abstaining then. <laughs> Um, Nadia, there's a question in the chat about README files. I think that um, Miriam's presentation will provide a lot more clarity on what sort of files are provided to show you what, how to interpret the data and what you're looking at. So if you still have a question at the uh, end of Miriam's presentation on IPMS DHS, definitely put the question in the Q&A again so that we make sure to come back to that. Excellent question. All right, I'm gonna give 15 more seconds to the poll. And 
Thank you everyone who responded and those who uh, are not current Oakland's users and mentioned so in the chat. Um, oh, I can share the results. Excellent. Devin, are you seeing the results? I am. Yeah. And um, I've also worked on IPM's higher ed, so I'm just so glad to see that someone there has used it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, um, that's all I have for right now. Um, and then I'll move forward a little bit. So, um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, um, We'll get to Nadia's question later, and and just to revisit the um, the schedule. It looks like we're um, we're running on uh, on time, so this is great. Uh, and even just a little bit early, so I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. King. I'm going to stop my sharing. Okay, are you all seeing um, the IFMS DHS slide? I see it. Great. <clears throat> I'm Miriam King. I'm a demographer who um, manages the IFMS DHS project and um, also is one of the principal investigators on this project, which has been going for 10 years and just got uh, refunded to go another five years. Again, um, here's our schedule. Um, I should be going until about um, 9.55, and I'll be talking a little bit about the DHS and IPAMS DHS, and then I'll be demonstrating the website interactively. And you'll learn a lot more about how the documentation works. Um, we, we designed it to be as user-friendly and informative as possible. And I think a lot of questions like, you know, how do I, how do I learn about what's in the material um, will be demonstrated there. So um, I see a number of you have used IFMS DHS, and I know from exhibiting at Q in the past that there are a lot of DHS users uh, who attend the conference. But just so that we're all on the same page about this, DHS stands for the Demographic and Health Surveys. These have been um, collecting data from the mid 1980s to the present um, with funding from USAID. The uh, DHS project website describes what they do as collecting and disseminating accurate and representative data on population health, HIV and nutrition. And the word health there encompasses a lot of different um, uh, topics such as acute illness in young children, uh, infant and maternal health, um, fistula, domestic violence, um, all, all sorts of um, health topics. Um, so far, the DHS has conducted over 400 surveys in more than 90 countries, and it has been the leading source of information on health in low and middle income countries. So what is IFMS DHS? Well, we start with the public use files um, from the DHS program. We don't collect the data. We work in collaboration with the DHS project and participating countries. Um, and we uh, have built a website that makes it possible to browse integrated variables, learn about the variables and create a custom data set. So you include only the samples and only the variables that are relevant to your own research project. To get access to the data, you register with the DHS program. If you've already used DHS data, you can use your DHS user um, email and password. Um, and um, the main strength of IPAMS DHS, as opposed to the original DHS files, is that it makes it much easier to study change over time across multiple years or uh, conducting comparative analysis across multiple countries. And I think Devin's uh, example of the integrated education um, variable should um, give an example of how that, how that adds uniformity to um, very disparate data going in without losing any detail. Um, as I said, our source material is the microdata from the DHS public use files 
which we recode to be consistent across countries and sample years without losing any information. Um, on the website, there's extensive information about each variable. And thus far, we've created over 15,000 integrated variables. The scope of IPMS DHS at present is 170 samples and 41 countries. So I mentioned just before, um, 90 countries and 400 samples. Um, we started with a big backup log of data to integrate. Um, and our first two years of funding um, from NIH gave us um, funds to harmonize data from Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. Our next five years of funding um, are basically giving us material to go global. So we will also be adding data from Latin America, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, um, Central and East Asia, and Oceania. Oh, and I should also mention that when they say there are 400 DHS surveys, um, these cover different kinds of surveys like AIDS monitoring surveys, malaria monitoring surveys, service provider um, surveys. Um, we have thus far done the standard, most widely used um, DHS survey, which is very broad in scope. Um, the interim DHS surveys, which are like the standard, but often a little shorter and continuous DHS surveys, um, which is when a country like Senegal does the standard DHS survey year after year after year without a break. Mostly they're done five to 10 years apart for a country. So um, after that summary, I'm gonna go to looking at with you at the DHS website. Um, and it's an example of how IFM's websites work in general. So once you get comfortable with one of them, uh, you should be comfortable with all of the uh, IFMS microdata websites. I'm going to review how to construct your data set by selecting variables and looking at the variable documentation. I'm going to frame this in terms of answering a question, how does intimate partner violence, IPV, vary across countries? Then I'll review how to download a, your customized data set, setting preferences for the type of data file, saving and modifying a data file so you could go back and um, revisit um, an old work that you've done and add more variables or another country um, and uh, some troubleshooting and opening the data file and some supplemental material that's on our, um, on our website. And um, again, if you have questions, um, please use the Q&A function. Um, you, can answer, you can enter questions at any time. Um, we will also have some breaks. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a new share to the IFMS DHS website, which I hope you can all see. Um, so I'm going to start with these big buttons down here in the middle. Um, and the, the first thing that nearly everyone wants to do on our website um, is to see what data are available. So create an extract, get data is probably where nearly everyone starts. Um, and that way you can see what samples are available, what variables are in those samples and learn about the individual variables. There are two other big buttons here. There's an online tool for data analysis and online tabulator. My colleague Shula Sarkar will be demonstrating that um, for IFMS International Data and IFMS DHS uh, works the same way and also create an account um, by registering for DHS data access if you haven't already done so. So if you click, if you've already registered for the DHS, you're golden. But um, if you haven't, you can click on this button and it will take you to a link that will bring you to the DHS program website um, and you can um, specify the samples that you want and give a short summary of the research that you want to do. Now, anyone can use our website for information or planning their research, but for you to download a data file to your computer for analysis, you have to be uh, get permission from the DHS program. So I'm gonna click on get data. And the first thing I have to do is choose my unit of analysis. If you've worked with DHS data before, you know there are separate files for separate units of analysis. Uh, women of childbearing age, their young children, their births, um, all members of households, 
non-elderly men. And this last category, women months, is for the reproductive calendar data that I'll be talking about briefly at the very end of this webinar. And I'm going to start with data on women because my question is about um, differences in the uh, prevalence of intimate partner violence in different countries. So clicking on women, pretty soon, um, we should only see the data um, for, um, for women. We should only see the variables for women. And this is a little odd. There we go. All right, sorry, it's a little bit slow today. So um, I can, there are uh, two places to start for this. You can uh, select your samples or you can, um, and say, choose what you want to be displayed. Um, or you can start with topics. And I'm going to start with topics. Unfortunately, I have just a little screen here with, oops, I lost you. Sorry, are you still seeing the website? Yep, we can still we can see the um, okay the screen. Yeah, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get to um, uh, intimate partner violence, and I have such a little screen here. I'm going to go a different way. I'm going to search for a term. So I know there's an intimate partner violence question that relates to slapping. So I'm going to enter in advanced search. I'm going to enter slap with an asterisk for slap, slap, slappings, whatever. Okay, and this brings me to a variable frequency slapped by partner in last 12 months. Now from here, I can go into the domestic violence by partner husband um, list of variables, which I was trying to do from the chop down menu. I usually don't work with just um, the laptop screen. I usually can see more. Okay, so um, I wanna explain what you're seeing on screen here. Um, we have the surveys across the top. We have the variables off to the side, the name of the variable um, and the label. And then X's means that that variable is present in that sample, dot means that it is not. And this is kind of an overwhelming amount of information. And I'm not really interested in the samples that don't include information on intimate partner violence. So I'm gonna go to select samples instead, and I'm gonna limit the number of samples displayed here. And um, I'm going to go with, Egypt, oops, I'm gonna take just the most recent sample for Egypt, Ethiopia, Ghana, India, and Jordan and submit my sample selections. And something else I have to do is log in because um, the system needs to know that I'm an approved DHS user so I can actually make a data file. So I'm gonna log in by clicking on log in at the top here and enter. The email and password that I use with the DHS. Okay, and now you can see that the samples are shown in green, and that means I have permission to download data from those samples. So if you um, have gotten permission to use some DHS samples, but maybe they've released um, new samples or new countries since then, um, if you saw the samples in purple, that would remind you, oh, if I want to analyze those data, I need to go back to the DHS program and request um, uh, permission to use those samples too. Now let's look at, uh, it looks like a lot of the samples that I've chosen 
have um, many of these variables, but Ghana 2014 does not. So if there's no information about domestic partner violence in Ghana 2014, I wanna change that. So I'm gonna take Ghana 2014 out and resubmit my sample selection. So we never want you to be overwhelmed by information that isn't useful to you. We want you to be able to drill down and see um, exactly what interests you for your research project. Now looking here, um, I, I'm gonna say, well, I want all these variables. So um, I'm gonna click on this little mark here and that says, oh, I want all of those variables. But actually, as I go down to the bottom, I see that there are some variables on domestic violence that aren't present in all the samples. So I'm gonna deselect those because I want to look at this for all of the samples that I've chosen. Okay. Now I'm gonna direct your attention to the data cart. We use this um, as sort of a metaphor, like you were shopping from Amazon. You are quote, buying samples. I have bought four samples here and uh, 44 variables. But the nice thing about IPMS compared to uh, Amazon is you don't have to pay for anything. Um, so you get the, the samples and the variables you want for free. Now let's see how we can learn more about a variable. So I'm gonna find that um, DVP slap variable. This is a, a hyperlink, so I'm gonna click on that. This brings us to what we call a variable description. So you can learn a lot about that variable. So the first page um, or the first tab has unweighted codes and frequencies. And you'll see here that there's no yes missing. And then a lot of not in universe, nine. That means some women, actually a substantial number of them were not asked this question. So we have no information about them. Now, who wouldn't be asked this question? If we look at the universe tab, that tells us the universe who was asked the question. And we can see here, it's women who were selected and interviewed for the domestic violence module. Actually, um, for the domestic violence questions, one woman per household is randomly selected and asked the questions. Um, and she also has to agree to answer those questions. So um, a woman who was selected and agreed to be interviewed. Um, and then um, there's also the sampling frame. So for Egypt and Jordan, it's ever married women 15 to 49. For Ethiopia and India, it's all women. So if you were wanting to look across these samples, you might wanna restrict this to ever married women to be as comparable as possible. Okay, um, other tabs provide kind of a general description of the variable. This is very simple and straightforward in this case. Uh, comparability um, mentions issues that you should keep in mind when comparing some warnings. And um, in particular, um, there's some, some comments about Egypt and Jordan here. And they say, well, Egypt and Jordan ask about arm twisting in addition to slapping, whereas the other two samples just asked about slapping. And then you can also see, and this is a nice feature, the survey text associated with the variable. So we have a, a small army of undergrads that type up the survey text and tag it to associate the question wording with um, each variable. And so for example, for Egypt, um, the question begins, did your last, did your husband or your last husband ever do any of the following to you, slap you, um, and so on. And you could look across these um, uh, samples to see that the wording really is comparable. Um, another nice feature is you can jump into the whole document by clicking on text here. This goes right to the question that we're looking at, but you can also move up and see uh, what text preceded this, what text followed it, which might affect um, uh, the responses. Okay, um, so uh, that is um, how basically you can um, see the variables, select them, um, and um, add them to your data cart. Um, now I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna also say, well, maybe we wanna control for a few things. I mentioned um, uh, that we wanted to probably control for marital status. So I'm gonna look at the drop down menu again and find demographic and marriage and cohabitation.
And we see there's a variable called MarStat that would let me control that. But I want that in my, that's already marked as a plus in my data cart. It says women's current marital status or union status is a pre-selected variable. And pre-selected variables are ones that we automatically add to your data file, um, regardless of whether you ask them or, for them or not. You can ignore them if you want to, but these are variables we know from our records that people are most likely to request. And so, you know, you don't want to start your analysis and realize, oh, I forgot to include age or um, whatever. So um, a lot of variables um, that are widely downloaded, um, geography variables for those samples, and um, variables related to variance estimation and weights we automatically add to your data file. So we start with, I chose 44 variables and four samples. I'm gonna view my data cart now to see what that looks like. And uh, here we see um, that actually, I, I see a bunch of these pre-selected variables up at the top, like what sample is this, what country, what year, um, and then the variables that I chose on um, uh, domestic violence down at the bottom. So um, you can go back and add more variables if you think of something else or add more samples or drop samples but I'm satisfied with this, so I'm gonna create my data extract. Now, this um, system is remembering, so it says I have four samples and 94 variables. That means 50 were pre-selected and 44 I chose. And um, the system is remembering that I work in Stata, so it's creating um, a Stata file for me. But if you work in some other format, um, such as SPSS or SAS, or you want a comma to delimited or fixed width text, text file, um, you can apply, um, change that, that specificity. And if you're the first time user, um, it will assume that you want a fixed width text file. So I want to um, apply Stata and I want to include a um, description of what my data file is because um, it's really easy to forget when you have hundreds of these. I wonder what I was doing with that one. And submit your extract. And in a very few minutes, I should get an email saying that my data extract is ready. And um, another nice feature here is um, this is, I made a, um, um, a data file earlier um, today. And um, so um, uh, that data file is still here. There are a lot of other extracts that I've made and we don't hang on to the data files for a long time, just a few days, but we keep your specifications of what you asked for, what samples and what variables for a long time. So you can revisit an old file that you did like, oh, I did that. and. Now I wanna rerun that analysis with the latest data or add some other variables or whatever. So um, you don't have to hang on to all of your notes or all of your old printouts or whatever. You can just go back, revisit a data file, rerun it, change it and so on. Um, so um, that is basically uh, how you um, uh, make a data file. And um, if when this is done processing, I could double click on it and get a Stata file and start my analysis. Um, I also mentioned in terms of troubleshooting, the most uh, confusion that people run into is entering, opening their data file. And that's because we send the files zipped. Um, if you look here, you see for instructions on downloading and opening an extract on your computer, go here. If you click here, this is going to, um, provide you with detailed instructions, including where to get decompression software if you don't already have it on your, um, on your computer. Um, I'm gonna show you some other nice features in terms of what is available on the IPAMS microdata websites. Um, so uh, there are uh, often additional materials that are of interest off in the left sidebar. So for example, um, we have supplemental data on geography, including um, GPS shape files, for example. Um, we have uh, integrated um, geography where there's the same geographic footprint 
over time for the for the units. And Shula will be talking about that later in this, but you can also um, get the, uh, the integrated um, GPS file. Um, there's also uh, user notes that we've written on particular topics. If you're new to IPMS DHS, I strongly encourage you to look at the, the IPMS DHS user guide. This is a very detailed step-by-step -step guide with lots of screenshots that can walk you through how to use the website. And there are other um, useful user notes like guidance on vaccine schedules, um, contextual variables, using weights to uh, inflate the total so it's up to the population total rather than the sample size total and so on. Um, there are descriptions, <coughs> excuse me, of the samples, including what is the sample size? for the different units of analysis, um, the sample universes. And um, usually, for example, it's women 15 to 49, but are all women 15 to 49, but there are cases where it's a different age range or it's, it's all ever married women only. So you can consult that. Um, also, if you go up to help, or I'm sorry, um, oops, I need to move this down. Um, if you go to support um, on the top links there, there's a lot of material that you can use for self-teaching or if you are um, an instructor um, that you could use in your classroom. There are video tutorials on how to do various things. There are uh, past webinars. We hope to post this webinar here eventually. Um, the different user notes, um, training exercises where we have a question that you can answer using the data and um, the answer is supplied. So you can use that as a self-teaching exercise or kind of a starting point for having your class um, answer a question with the data and um, a reminder of uh, ways you can get um, help, including the IPMS user forum and the DHS program user forum. Um, and uh, I think um, I want to go back to, I have a little bit more time, so I'm going to go back to select data and show you a couple other. Um, hey, Miriam. Uh, yes. Um, we have a question in the okay. chat about uh, getting access to samples that aren't in green and how the login to DHS as in relationship to the IPMS DHS. And so can you spend a little bit more time talking about the login feature? Sure, sure. So I will go to um, home and create an extract and register. And then this will take you to the DHS program request data access, their website. If you are a DHS user already, but you wanted to have access to another data set, um, you would log in as um, um, with your old, uh, your, your existing DHS um, user website. Um, so it says, please log in here if you already have an approved account. So let's say you ask for data for India, and now you think, oh, I really want to look at some sub-Saharan African countries. You could uh, click here, enter your username, um, your email, and your password, and then select additional countries and submit that. If you were a completely new user of IPMS DHS data, you would go to, uh, for new users, new user registration form, your um, name, your uh, password, um, your um, institutional affiliation, um, and then a, uh, uh, your country and so on. They need to collect this to give reports to USAID, their funder. And um, then uh, if you filled all this in, you'd be taken to a box that you need to fill in a few sentences on what you wanted to look at. It doesn't have to be deeply detailed. Like I would look to, like to look at multiple Sub-Saharan African countries to see differences in antenatal care and maternal and child health over time, looking at differences across countries 
and um, change over time, for example. You need to get it to a certain number of characters, but it's not a lot, it's like 300 characters. So fill out the whole thing, submit it, and their data um, archivist should get back to you uh, within um, a few days. And they really do want people to use their data. So, um, um, you know, they will want to say yes to you if you are um, using it for um, nonprofit, you know, public good. Um, any other questions I can answer, Anna? Uh, we just had a question come in uh, that asks, is IPAM's DHS different from DHS? Can you just highlight some of the key differences? Sure, please? absolutely. So um, the, uh, well, I'm gonna go back to select data and show you um, a couple of things. One is um, the codes are often different because we have to take into account the um, wide range of answers and codes across multiple samples. So I'm going to go to say the education variables. Um, so uh, first of all, um, we've given the variables mnemonic names um, that I find easier to remember than V whatever. But um, you can, if you want, uh, on the website, choose to look at the original DHS variable name. So I'm going to click on this for the display of education variables. So what I called educ level, for example, I got to do the drop down again. Now you see variable names that look like V106, V107, or whatever. Um, those would be the original DHS variable names. So some people are more comfortable working with those, but you will get the IPAMS DHS names in your data extract. Um, sometimes we have a, um, um, a variable that, that is, uh, doesn't really have a standard name in the DHS, like LitBrig here, which is a lit uh, bridge for the, um, the uh, literacy variable. And you can see here that um, there are different ways that people could answer the literacy variable. So we had to make that a two digit variable uh, because some samples just have yes, no reads and others have uh, whether the person reads easily or with difficulty um, and so on. So often the codes are uh, different. Um, often there's more digits to keep the detail in all the different countries and samples. Um, so, um, you know, we start with the raw material, but we do change the names and we often change the codes. If it's a simple, uh, very straightforward, yes, no, then um, probably the codes are the same. Anything else, Anna, that I can tackle? Those are all the questions in the chat. Thanks, Miriam. Okay, well, I think I have uh, pretty much covered. I was going to go back and show how you could look at the original DHS names because I forgot to do that, but that question forced me to answer that um, directly. So I am going to stop sharing and uh, people can take a little break. While we wait for everyone to, um, to get back in, I did uh, want to address a question um, in the Q&A about um, how to access the data or what it looks like in Stata. Um, and I just wanted to take a quick moment to show you um, where to access all of the like training videos and a lot of resources directly on the IPM site. So if you go to ipums.org and go over to support, um, there's uh, you know, our user forum here, the um, data training exercises Miriam was talking about, other teaching resources, a way to contact us. Um, but in particular, this uh, video tutorials page has so many resources, um, including a whole, like almost every webinar that we have done that we've recorded. Um, and then we have um, project specific online tutorials. Um, but in particular, um, we can do, uh, so if you wanted to watch how to open an extract in Stata, that should show you um, how the, the data will appear. I mean, it, it brings in, um, you know, variable and value labels. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm a Stata user myself. Um, I love using the Stata version um, of IPMS, um, 
data files. So I will now get started um, with my presentation on uh, IPLM's PMA. Um, so as I said earlier, um, I'm the project manager of IPLM's PMA. Um, and I'll be talking for just under 20 minutes, probably even a little less. Um, but I think we will hold any questions um, until um, after Anna um, presents on IPLM's mix. Um, so there we go. Um, so we harmonize performance monitoring for action. Um, it is a, um, a kind of a, a, a newer um, data series. Um, so in order to, okay. So it began as Performance Monitoring and Accountability 2020. Um, it's a high frequency and recent survey series on family planning, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, and it, its first survey was in 2013. Um, it was, it is currently fielded in nine countries in Africa and Asia. It was initially 12 participating. Uh, and it was originally designed to monitor um, family planning indicators and progress towards FP 2020 goals. Um, so it is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and fielded by uh, a team at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and we, we um, IPM's PMA is also funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, we currently have a, more than 180 samples, uh, more than 6,000 variables, and more than 2 million records. Okay, um, so here's just an overview of the of the countries that we have. So we, the currently participating countries are Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, India, Kenya, Niger, Nigeria, and Uganda. And so Indonesia and Ghana um, are no longer, uh, no longer active in PMA, but we still have those data. So, um, for the female, the household and female samples, um, which are the core of PMA, uh, they use a sampling design that is um, almost identical to the DHS. Uh, it's very closely follows it. Um, they use a multi-stage stratified cluster sampling um, where they randomly sample um, enumeration areas that were provided by the country's census or statistic bureau, uh, statistical bureau. Uh, and they segment and supplement those, um, those EAs uh, to get them to about 200 households each. Uh, and then from those small areas, they randomly select about 35 households. Um, and then they collect a household roster from those sampled households. If there are women who live in those households that are between the ages of 15 and 49, they'll return another day and then give um, those women a uh, more detailed survey. Um, and PMA constructs normalized uh, survey weights for use with these cross-sectional samples. Um, so like Miriam said, once you get to know one, um, one IPUMS page, uh, you'll know how to use them all. Um, so it looks very familiar to, um, it looks very similar to the IPUMS DHS page. Um, and the registration to use IPUMS PMA is slightly different. You do not need to have a registration with performance monitoring for action. Um, so what you would do is go to our website and over in the left-hand side, or if you scroll down, you can't see it on, uh, on this screenshot, um, but you go to register. Um, the restriction on using these data are that uh, you cannot use it for a commercial purpose. So you can use it as, um, as an educator, a student, a researcher, a policymaker, a journalist, uh, anything that is non-commercial. Uh, so we review each of those um, registrations individually. You just tell us about the, um, the countries that you're uh, planning to research and a bit about your topic. Uh, and then we'll approve that if, if your research topic is appropriate. Um, so um, much like the DHS, when you go to select data, you'll be um, prompted by a screen that looks like this. Um, so in PMA, our units of analysis are, uh, we have person level data, we have um, service delivery points or um, these are like health facilities. And we also have data at the infant level. 
Um, and uh, what's a little different for PMA is that um, based on their, um, the differences in their survey sampling, we, um, we keep the topic areas separate. Um, so you just click on the, uh, the topic that you were interested in downloading data about. Um, and again, this will look very familiar to you. Um, you select samples um, and then browse through the variables by topic. So a little bit more about the very the core of PMA. Um, so they uh, collected cross-sectional samples between 2013 and 2018. Um, and when I say that this is a high frequency survey series, they were, um, they were really interested in fielding an innovative way of collecting data where they have women who live in the small areas going out with mobile phones and um, doing the interviews and loading the responses directly up to the cloud. So there was a high turnover. Um, they were interviewing the same areas at least yearly, sometimes um, every six months for some countries. Um, they've decided to um, refocus a little bit um, because they were originally focused on family planning, but also water and sanitation indicators, but they're, they've decided to refocus on the reproductive health so um, they've started a longitudinal panel of um, women of childbearing age, and that began in 2019. Um, so um, but, I mean, they're still collecting um, really great data on uh, the household, their uh, possessions, um, their water sources and sanitation facilities. Um, but in the female questionnaire, there's a lot more detail, um, very standard questions on um, on fertility, family planning, and reproductive health. Um, and they um, kind of bring topic modules in and out. Um, they have some questions uh, very detailed about migration um, on some like economic empowerment, some more taboo topics like menstrual hygiene. Uh, there's some questions about domestic or gender-based violence. Uh, they also ask a lot of questions on abortion in a couple, um, in a couple of countries, uh, but they're also interested in um, investigating whether side effects um, of contraceptives has an effect on, um, uh, on whether women use or discontinue the use of contraceptives. Um, there is a contraceptive calendar in a few select samples. Um, and then um, one way that the that, that PMA kind of deviates um, from DHS is that while DHS has some spa surveys where they um, give uh, surveys to, um, to health facilities, what PMA does is they interview um, people at working at health facilities, but in the same small areas as the surveyed households. So you can link um, by small area uh, information about the service uh, provision environment um, uh, and then um, link that to perhaps health outcomes um, um, in, uh, for the uh, outlift women uh, of childbearing age. So they chose up to three public and three private health facilities within that small area. Um, they also gathered information about stockouts um, and other health services, for example, um, whether they provide antenatal care or, um, or whether they offer family planning at, um, uh, when like babies are delivered. Um, so there's a lot of potential with linking the um, service but, um, provider files with the household and female. Um, and one thing that they uh, initiated with a very quick turnaround um, is that because they had started their fa um, family planning panel data, um, in 2019, they had the phone numbers of women in Burkina Faso, DRC, Kenya, Nigeria, um, when COVID was happening. So what they did is they, they created a COVID survey um, by phone um, and asked them questions about whether they're having issues accessing health, uh, healthcare, um, maybe antenatal care or or family planning care because of the lockdowns and restrictions, whether they lost income, how concerned they were um, with the information sources that they were getting about COVID and with how much they trusted those sources. Um, there's some really, really great potential 
um, for research using uh, being able to link you know their baseline information to what they responded um, in like during the COVID-19 survey. Um, and then there's uh, also some data about uh, maternal and newborn health. So there are two Ethiopia cohort studies of pregnant women. The first one um, is already on our website and that was that began in 2016. Um, there was one that um, is still ongoing. So we will probably have the data from the most recent cohort later this year. Uh, and that those questions um, focus a lot on antenatal care um, and then also gather a lot of information about um, how the pregnancy went, whether there was uh, a skilled uh, birth attendant, what delivery complications there were, uh, and then also with a lot of frequent follow-ups on um, whether the infant um, you know, has, was coughing or um, had a cold or um, other things early on in life, and also a few questions on their vaccination uh, in their first six months of life. Um, another um, topic that PMA collects, again, they, they're trying new things all the time. Uh, this is a very recent survey. Um, what they've done is at uh, a few select um, SDP uh, facilities, they will um, uh, wait outside, like the interview will wait outside, and as a family planning, uh, family planning client will exit, they will give um, a short interview if they consent to be interviewed. Uh, and they ask a lot about like, did uh, what was the method that you wanted? Did you get the method that you wanted at this um, at this uh, appointment? What was the quality of your care? How did you get here? What was your wait time? Um, some really interesting questions there. Um, and then finally, there was a small um, uh, there was a it was a two round nutrition survey in Burkina Faso and Kenya. Um, and so they were asking questions about the diet of children under five and uh, some biomarkers like um, the arm, upper arm circumference. They also asked a few questions about household food security, antenatal nutrition, and breastfeeding assistance. Um, and one other really fun thing about the Evans PMA grant is that we have a, a team that um, is the data analysis hub. Um, so what we do is take um, take the IPMS PMA data uh, and document how to um, do interesting data visualizations or, or show you um, how to link climate data to IPMS PMA data. Um, and uh, that, that team is fantastic with their data visualizations uh, and their research. Uh, but most importantly, they're showing you how, like step-by-step, step, how you work with the data, how you transform it, how to better understand it. Um, and one example I wanted to share quickly is that um, one of our postdocs was looking at the client exit interviews, uh, and she was looking at whether um, some uh, ACLA data about armed conflict and unrest um, uh, was affecting the mode of transportation um, that a woman was taking to her um, to her facility. Uh, she did find a little bit of um, a, a little bit of effect um, that it seemed that women who were in areas of high conflict were less likely to go to the facility nearest to them. And there's um, a lot of, more to that analysis. And I definitely encourage you to check um, the blog for that. Um, so with that, um, I am a little bit early, um, but I think I will hand it over to Dr. Bogren. And then we'll take questions um, at the end of IPM's mix. Thanks, Evan. Uh, let me look at my slides. There we go. Uh, like Devin said, we will hold questions until the end of my portion of this presentation. And that break at 1040 to 1050 Pacific time, we will hold that entire 10 minutes as a solid break. So definitely you can look forward to stretching your legs or getting a glass of water, whatever you need to at 1040 Pacific. I am, so my name is Anna Bulgren and I'm also a research scientist at IPMS. 
and I'm very excited to present today on the newest IFMS data collection. We will be launching hopefully later this spring and join the IFMS Global Health Projects of DHS and PM, IFMS PMA. Uh, so the IFMS Mix project, this is the first time it's ever been announced publicly. Uh, you will not see it on the website at all until we launch either later this spring or in the summer. The uh, IFMS Mix harmonizes and integrates data from the UNICEF Mix surveys. Mix stands for the Multiple Indicator Cluster Surveys, and these surveys were designed and developed by UNICEF in the 1990s and conducted in partnership with countries around the world for the last three decades. The surveys share many similarities with the DHS surveys as they target women and children to track the progress on the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and the MIX data collection has several unique features that I will highlight below. UNICEF strives to produce comparable data across all the countries that they work in. However, like Miriam showed with the DHS, occasionally these different, there are differences across countries. And that's where IPOMS Mix comes in. Like all of the other IPOMS projects, IPOMS Mix fully harmonizes and integrates the UNICEF Mix data and disseminates it through the IPOMS website. IPOMS Mix has partnered with UNICEF to create a system that is easier for users to access and download data across time and place. At the first data release, IPOMS Mix will have 88 countries, 200 samples, and over 1,000 data sets across different units of analysis, which I'll describe in just a sec. Um, and we will be releasing over 900 variables. Uh, there will also be a registration process similar to what Miriam and Devin both described with the IPOMS DHS and IPOMS PMA projects uh, in collaboration with the UNICEF project. The focus of the IPOMS Mix data collection is to provide data available for all available countries at the time of the first data release, and we'll continue to expand our collection of harmonized variables in the subsequent releases. Here's a map showing the coverage of the IPOMS Mix data. Many of the countries shown here actually have multiple surveys that are spaced about every five or 10 years apart. Uh, and in addition, there's a small number of countries that have a statistically representative either subnational geography sample or a subnational uh, population sample. And those will also be included in the IPOMS Mix collection. Over time, there have been different rounds of the Mix survey where either major or minor changes have been made. Uh, this is a little bit similar to the concept of phases in the DHS surveys and we'll be releasing all samples from rounds three, four, five, and six uh, up until the time of the data release. So we're going to do our best to stay on top of all new data coming out from UNICEF as fast as possible uh, and release them into the IPOMS mix system shortly after they become available at UNICEF. Eventually, we hope to expand our data collection back in time to rounds two uh, whenever possible. Uh, so as we're releasing all the countries at once, the area that we will continue at IPOMS Mix to develop over time is the harmonized variables. So at the first data release, we'll include variables from all major units of analysis from the Mix model questionnaires. So let me describe a little bit about the different units of analysis. Fundamentally, the Mix questionnaire is pretty similar to the DHS surveys, but I will point out some very key differences. Um, and at its base is a household questionnaire. Included in the first data release will be information on the household roster, household characteristics, water and sanitation, and a unique water quality module where field teams actually measure the levels of E. coli found in the household drinking water. And this water quality module is available for round six samples. So those are the most recent round of samples in the UNICEF data. The primary focus of MIX is women of reproductive age, uh, and women as the unit of analysis is available for all countries across all rounds. 
In addition to basic demographic information, the variables that will be available for IPOMS mix include reproductive health, maternal and newborn child health, and fertility history. And for many countries, there will also be a separate data set with a woman's complete birth history and information on female genital cutting for a woman and her daughters. For many samples, there's also a questionnaire for men. Typically, these are men age uh, 15 to 49. Um, these are most common in the later round five and six uh, rounds. And data for men uh, is also typically available for women too. And so variable groups that cover different topics for men and women include mass media consumption, sexual behavior, HIV, domestic violence attitudes, and life satisfaction. And all of these different topics will be available in the first IPOMS mix data release. All samples will have a questionnaire for children aged zero to four in the household. And this will include not only children who are living with their biological mother, but all children in the household, which is a pretty unique feature to mix. Topics that will be included uh, in IPOMS mix about children under age five include basic demography, child functioning, early childhood education and development, anthropometry measures, uh, recent illness, and child discipline. And as a final unit of analysis that's really unique to mix is the inclusion of a survey specifically for children five to 17. This adolescent age group is often overlooked in global health surveys and the mix data specifically for the most recent samples in round six uh, will include information on child demography, uh, foundational learning, parental involvement, child discipline, and child labor. The IPAMS mix data collection will include all of these different units of analysis upon launch. They can be linked together to strengthen analysis. We will be expanding the topics uh, for all of the units uh, in subsequent data releases as we continue to harmonize more variables, specifically those found in the model questionnaires and then in the country-specific questionnaires. There are more topics that the UNICEF mix data covers uh, that I didn't mention today because they are not uh, yet in the IPAMS mix collection. And so if you see anything, um, if there's a module of interest that you see in the UNICEF collection that's not in the IPAMS mix collection once it's released, please reach out and we can do our best to prioritize requests. I'm gonna now spend a little bit of time talking about the three different IPMS global health projects. Overall, there are a lot of similarities. All three data collection efforts seek to gather nationally representative and high quality survey data to create demographic and health indicators. The Performance Monitoring for Action, DHS program and UNICEF mix all have constructed their data using similar sampling designs and comparable questionnaires. There are many common topics shared across the three projects, and the question warning and universes can be similar. When there are differences in question wording and universes, that's where the mix uh, metadata on the website, as Miriam showed earlier, really comes in handy to highlight differences across comparability and questionnaire to make it easier for researchers. There are some fundamental differences across the three global health projects, including which countries are included in the data collection, uh, what time and how far back the um, surveys go, and how frequency, frequently the data is collected. Another uh, key difference is the units of analysis. Each of the IPOMS global health data collections has some units of analysis that are similar, including household members, women, and children. Some also some units of analysis are available in two of the three global health projects, including the birth histories, the information on female genital cutting, uh, care, household characteristics, men, and calendar data. And as Devin mentioned, uh, and Miriam, I think we'll talk about it a little bit, there are some really unique features of each of the three global health projects uh, that aren't found in the other data collections. In the future, we hope to allow users to use data from any of these three data collections in conjunction with other IPMS data. However, we are not set up to do this at this time. 
Let me repeat that we are not set up to assist users to combine and pool data across the global health projects at this time. Users are encouraged to use extreme caution before pooling across the data because there are major and minor differences that would affect an analysis. Please use the IPMS metadata available on the website for full information about questionnaire wording, universes, uh, and variable availability for the different projects. We are happy to assist researchers to identify which of the IPMS data collection is best suited for their specific research needs. Um, and you can check back on the IPMS Global Health website frequently to see when the IPMS Mix project will launch. Uh, and it will also be announced in the IPMS uh, user email list serve. So feel free to sign up for that if you haven't already. Uh, we will now pause and answer some questions about any of the Global Health projects and prepare for the break. So I'm going to stop sharing. I um, just wanted to mention that someone uh, participating um, raised their hand. Um, and unfortunately, I don't really know how to respond with um, that format in this webinar. So if any of you have a question, if you could enter it into the um, Q&A, um, we can deal with it that way. I don't think we're set up to um, bring you in when you raise your hand. Thank you, Miriam. Um, we do have a question about what geographic identifiers does each observation in mix have? Um, for example, uh, are cluster IDs given, um, provinces, um, GPS points, and so on? So what, what level of um, geography and what format is available? Great question. Uh, for the IPMS mix, the district level or um, uh, province level geography will be available. I'm actually going to send it over to Shula to help answer that question. Perfect. Thanks, Anna. I can take that question. So mix uh, geography has a varied level of geography. So for some of the countries we are working on, there is information on just the primary level of geography, like equivalent to state in the United States, like department provinces. And then uh, for some other samples, uh, they go really deep down, like, uh, like to the village level. It depends on how, I think how much funding they have for each particular region. So sometimes mix will go down to very low levels of geography, and then sometimes it will be just a higher level of geography. And also sometimes we have seen it's representative at the national level, or say the country is divided into four parts, like North, South, East, and West, and that's how the sample is representative. So there, there are all sorts of things uh, going on. Uh, and I'll give it back to you. Thanks, Sheila. And to just reiterate, we will not have the latitude and longitude of any of the clusters available in the IPMS mix. I was just um, looking at um, one of the questions in the chat. Um, so uh, how often does IPMS collect data? Um, so um, I'm just gonna answer this live. So IPMS itself does not collect data. Uh, but we harmonize or integrate very, um, data from public use collections collected by other organizations. Uh, and the frequency of those data collections um, depends on, on the organization. For example, PMA collects data um, almost uh, or at least annually. Um, but um, and Miriam, you can correct me, but I believe like the general span between DHS samples is usually around five years, four or four to six. Um, yeah, I would different. say I would say um, five years, sometimes ten years. Um, I also just want to um, mention there is how often is data collected. There's also maybe embedded in that a question on how often do we release data. Um, so when we release data, it's at least once a year. 
um, we try to include um, recent, the, the latest data from countries already in IFMS DHS, for example. And um, ideally, um, IFMS DHS would be releasing data more than once a year, but at least once a year and um, prioritizing adding the latest samples as well as uh, adding new countries. So um, there's also um, how often do we make it available to the public as well as how often is the data collected. Yeah, that's a great point. And because um, IPMS PMA releases um, at least twice a year, uh, just because their data collection is so frequent. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the IPMS International releases generally once a year. Is that right, Shula? Um, but I guess you can get that to that when you're presenting on IPMS International. Could you repeat the question, Debbie? Sorry. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. IPMS International releases um, data about once a year. Is that the yes, thing? IPMS International releases once a year. In fact, a bunch of data came out last week. So you, the announcement hasn't gone out, but there has been a release last week. Yeah, any other questions? Um, yeah, we've got plenty of time before the break. Okay, looks like there's a question in the chat about um, boundary files. Um, I can take that, Devin. Great. Um, so are there boundary files available for Mix? Yes, there was another question in the chat, kind of the same one. Yes, Mix will have boundary files. Also, uh, just uh, like IPMS DHS has boundary files. I think some of the users mentioned that they used it. IPMS PMA also uh, distributes boundary files for the samples that it has data for and mix will definitely have that too. Thank you. I can answer the question about user guides being available for IFMS mix, similar to IFMS DHS. Yes, we will have user guides available um, shortly after the release or, or at the time of the release. I can give you a little preview that the IPMS mix dissemination system is going to look a little bit different than the other IPMS projects. And so there will definitely be user guides to help walk users through that process. Looks like one more question came up about mix. Um, so um, Annie, you can probably see the question. <laughs> yeah, I can answer that one too. Um, yes, to use the IPMS mix collection, you will have to make an account through UNICEF. Um, getting access to the UNICEF mix data is also free. You can do so on the UNICEF website, uh, unlike the DHS program, you don't have to request access to a specific country or a specific data set with UNICEF. It's just one user login and you have access to all of the data at all the time. Um, and so you will have to create such an account at UNICEF before you can use the IPMS mix data. Uh, and we will provide a user guide and details on exactly how that process looks uh, when, we, when we launch. Okay, great. Well, um, 
if there are no more questions, um, I just wanted to um, revisit the, um, the schedule really quickly. So um, we will still, we'll break until 10.50 uh, um, Pacific time, um, after which um, Dr. Sarkar is going to talk about IPMS International and the online data tabulator. Um, and then um, I keep saying Pacific time because um, all the people, uh, all the panelists here were on, um, on central time. So Pacific time starting at 1130, um, we'll be talking about special features in each of the uh, projects for, uh, we've discussed today and then remaining questions. Um, so it looks like no other questions came up um, still. So I think, yeah, just um, we'll do an early break and come back together in about 12 minutes. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a nice break, like stretched your feet and hands a little bit as we were able to do here. Um, welcome from Minnesota. It kind of snowed in the morning, but now we, the snow is gone and hopefully there won't be any more snow this season. So I'm Shula Sarkar. I work as a research scientist uh, in the IPAMS International project. IPAMS International is uh, a census data project. So it's census microdata that we collect uh, across the globe from other countries. Um, and um, I am a geographer by training and I also work uh, uh, for all the other projects in the global health projects. Like, so I do the geography for all the other projects, which is why you saw me answering all the geography questions in there. I am also responsible for all the maps and the GIS files that comes uh, with the project. So for this presentation, I'll talk more about the census microdata project. Um, so census data does not have much of health information in it, but census data is huge, like really large. So you can use your census data uh, as a contextual variable to all the health data that you are, health surveys that you're working with, get in some of the census variables uh, disaggregated by geography, and then you can do your analysis. So I am back to that same time schedule, which my colleagues have been showing. Uh, we are at a little bit after 10.50 Pacific time. And uh, I'll do a brief presentation. And then I will uh, do a very little website demonstration because my colleagues also mentioned that once you see one website, all of them are kind of the same, you know, how to uh, access all of them. But I'm gonna show you an important feature in the census data website. That's how do you analyze the data online, like on the fly, and that's kind of interesting. So here is the website uh, on IPOMS International. Our mission is to collect census microdata, document the data, harmonize the data. You have heard a lot of this term harmonization from my colleagues uh, before. Uh, dissemin disseminate the data to credible researchers free of charge. Um, and for most of the countries, uh, like uh, collecting the census data and leading up to the census, like that's a big thing. So IPAM's international project picks up where the national statistical offices lead, like once their data is collected and they publish the report, then they are kind of done. So we pick the microdata. Um, my colleagues uh, have talked about microdata a lot, so I'm not going to explain what that is. So this is not aggregated census data. It's like microdata, like uh, data in terms of uh, persons, like every household and persons, the raw data and how it is collected. Um, our work wouldn't have been possible without uh, 
the generous participation by the national statistical offices. Uh, we do not own their data. We are stewards of their data. And I do want to give a shout out uh, to all the national statistical partners that we have from who we collect the data. So um, like I said, our goal is data preservation as well. Uh, so here is, are some pictures from the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics uh, in Dhaka. Um, they had old census data that got moldy, like the tapes were moldy. We helped recover the data and we have that data in our collection. Here is another example from Sudan. Here, uh, the problem more is the little sand and the dust and all the tapes got destroyed. So we helped recover and then we kind of have the data distributed in our collection. So some of the features of the IPUMS International Project include they are microdata samples. They are anonymous because they are data about persons who are living like you and me. So they are anonymized and you cannot identify any people. They are harmonized with a consistent code scheme Geography is spatially harmonized and you have GIS files for all the census uh, administrative units that are distributed in the IPMS International Data Collection. We have a data extract system with extracts that can be customized. Uh, my colleague, um, Dr. King showed, uh, Maryam King showed you uh, how to uh, access that system. So I'm not going to go into details on that. Uh, but I will show you the online data analysis that's different for, for IPOMS International um, and that I will have some time. And again, uh, like all my colleagues have said, the data are free uh, to all credible researchers. So the dark blue indicates the countries on which we are uh, disseminating data. Right now we have data on 103 countries and 547 censuses. Uh, the greens are uh, the partners who are participating but whose data we don't have up yet. We have some historical samples that are in light blue. So to the right, I think there was a question which said, uh, did, uh, does IPOMS International release their data annually? Uh, yes. Uh, so as of last week, we released um, a new set of data sets. So here they are, um, a lot of labor force surveys. The Mexico ones I think would be really helpful. Uh, the ones in bold are new samples or countries, uh, new countries that we didn't have data for. Like Mexico, we had census data, but we didn't have labor force survey data. Um, not only do we have data for so many countries, we have several samples. Like for Indonesia here, we have nine censuses. So we have the darkest of colors. Um, so for US and Canada, we have historical data as well as contemporary data, but then Norway, Sweden, and some Scandinavian countries, we only have historical data. And darker the shade, more the samples uh, that we have data for. Um, the top, here are the top 30 variables requested by researchers. You have demographic characteristics, work, education, economic status, migration, household composition. Uh, this includes over 30 of the more than 1,900 harmonized variables that we distribute right now. Uh, we have more than 98,000 source variables. By source variables, we mean the variables that are originally given to us uh, by the census authorities. Um, and these are the highlighted ones are the most uh, variables that are requested by the users. Here are some publications that I listed. Uh, it, uh, people do a whole lot of research on marriages, education is a big topic, migration is another big topic. Here's another one on education, um, fertility, and so on. Uh, 
I'll demonstrate some of the data enhancements, uh, uh, what the IPUMS International project does in terms of enhancing the data. Questionnaires. We receive questionnaires in all formats and in all languages. So what the project does is translate all of this to an English format and distributes it to uh, the researchers. Code books also come in various formats from the uh, like um, national statistical offices, and they are also streamlined and then distributed in a specific format. So here is an example from South Africa 2011 census, their original questionnaire asking about water supply and piped water. And here is uh, the same questionnaire, which has been typed by the IPUMS staff. And this is how you would get it on the web. So, and then here is a screenshot of the website. I can go through one of uh, these when we are looking at the website. Um, here is a description of the same variable, what it means. And here is a comparability section, meaning how it differs from uh, um, sample to sample in the same country or between different countries um, and census rounds. Family interrelationship variables or pointer variables like we call uh, then they are uh, fairly common uh, for our researchers. Here it tells you about the location of the spouse or the parent um, or the child in the data set. So here, like the spouse's location is one, this is the spouse of this one, and then you have a one and two here. And these are aunts and children, so they get a spouse's location of zero. The same logic here, mom's location. So the three children get the mom's location number, that's person number two. And here, the same logic, pops, uh, the father's location, and then uh, they get a person number of one. Um, my colleagues went in detail about data harmonization. Devin did that. Um, so I am not going to show uh, data harmonization in the census data, but it's the same logic. Uh, we get codes uh, from in different formats and we bring it to a similar format where all the codes uh, and labels are made similar so that users can do comparative research between and within countries. <laughs> A little bit on geography here. Uh, like I said, we distribute shape files. So here is a map from China. The green lines are the administ first administrative level units of China, the provinces, equivalent to states in the United States. And then the red, blue, and the white lines are prefectures, or their second administrative units. Um, in China, so equivalent to our country, a county, let's say, in the United States. So um, if the boundaries of these prefectures never changed, you would only have seen one color. But these are three different censuses, and the fact that you see all the colors means that lines change, boundaries changed. So if you are doing your research on, let's say, educational attainment, over time, like you want to look at uh, something and, and over time educational attainment, then you would want to hold your space constant. Otherwise, uh, you are comparing a different space with another different space in another census. So that's what we mean by spatial harmonization. We'll talk a little bit uh, about that in the special, the last section of this webinar but I'm just going to give a brief intro. So here they are prefectures of China for all the three census years. And the black one is the spatially harmonized unit where uh, like you have fewer units, but you combine the two units such that the space is similar across all the three censuses of 1982, 90 and 2000. Uh, so that way you could do comparative analysis. 
So here are the GIS files availability um, for all the first level administrative boundaries that are stable through time in the IPOMS data collection. And the same here, but for the second level boundaries that are stable through time in the IPOMS data collection. So you have more than 16,500 uh, units here. Um, since this is a, a webinar where we are talking about global health projects plus census health projects, and um, I did see a question in the Q&A about crosswalks, like how, how would you bring all of these data, like how could you use census data along with one of the global health projects data? So here um, is an example from Bangladesh. To the left, you have the IPMS uh, DHS codes, or let's say codes from the DHS program. Um, you have five units in IPMS International. You have so many units here from Bangladesh 2011. So if you make a crosswalk, like combine both of them, Silet and Chittagong, uh, where one, like Select was created in 1998 from Chittagong and Rangpur was created from Rajshahi. So you combine these two and you have a code which you can use for both projects so that you can bring in census data as well as DHS data into the same um, analysis and use one or the other as a contextual variable. Mix is not released, so I kind of put a lighter color here, but the same logic here. Mix comes with an additional code in Bangladesh. Um, and then Ma Maiman Singh was created from Dhaka and in 2015, so we combine it here and we could, so here you can see we could use all these projects um, interchangeably and then combine several projects together for your analysis to bring in as much data as you want. Um, I did see there were some educators in the registration. So I just wanted to briefly touch uh, about classroom accounts. So uh, IPOMS data can be used to teach in your classrooms. The classroom accounts give students expedited access to the extract builder and the online data tabulator and they allow the instructors to share data sets directly with the students through the IPMS website. This is particularly useful for complex classroom exercises or exams where data extracts can be reused by modifying the data request with a different country or with a different year. We have some sample uh, classroom accounts from uh, different universities that I wanted to highlight. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to highlight some of the uses of uh, how census data has been used because like census data is huge, like the, it's a big collection. And for most of the samples, we have a 10% uh, sample data. So here um, by our count, we can say that around 35 sustainable development goals uh, can be uh, measured with the help of census data. Uh, the SDGs uh, are goals set by the United Nations. So uh, here are some that we listed. And then how could you use that for the SDG monitoring? Uh, you have a uniform coding and nothing is lost. You can disaggregate to very low levels of geography. You have GIS shape files for data visualization and spatial analysis. Um, and again, IPOMS data is harmonized across time and space. So just a quick example for an SDG goal. Here is percentage of youth, 15 to 24, not in education, employment, or training. Uh, that's goal 8.6.1 in the SDG goal. Here in the African countries, here you see a big discrepancy between the male and the female. So, so many females are not in education, um, training or employment, and the blue are the males. The same thing here for Argentina mapped out. 
So the lighter the color, the better it is. Uh, the darker the color, uh, the worse off the country is. You can see that the urban areas are kind of better off. And here is a gap in need, like a female to male ratio that we did. Another little example of women aged 20 to 24 who are married before the age of 18 in Tanzania. And we show that. Uh, and then I just wanted to highlight how the census data are used for COVID research. Uh, one of uh, the researchers uh, from the Center of Demographic Studies in Barcelona analyzed how age and co-residence patterns shape COVID-19 vulnerability. And they use data entirely from IPOMS International. This was published in the National Academy of Sciences and simulates COVID outbreak in 10% of the uh, population to investigate mortality. And they use most of the censuses we have in the IPOMS data collection to map this. Um, I did a Google search and found out uh, several more research that has been used for COVID research. Here is some from Brazil and Ireland. And then we have Colombia and uh, lots of COVID research done with census data. Also in um, the summer of 2020, researchers calculated uh, a series of population-based indicators from census microdata for the UNFPA's COVID-19 population vulnerability dashboard. So here is an example of that. So to sum up, why use IPOMS data? Like, why do you care? It's high quality uh, and they have enormous value for research in policy and de development. You can do custom disaggregation, you can study small populations, and you can use it for policy research in health data, in population growth, migration, education, equity, um, etc. I'm going to stop here with my presentation and ask my colleagues if there are any questions that I could answer before I move on to the website. No? Okay. So I'm going to quickly move on to the website. Where am I getting time? Kind of okay. So here is the IPOMS International website. A couple of things that I wanted to show uh, in the website really quick. First is the select data button and the select samples. I did want to show the huge array of samples that you can get. If you scroll down, you can also like have tabs for Africa, Americas. There are the historical samples and here are the surveys, um, the Spain and the Mexico surveys that I was talking about. Um, so I'm going to go back to my select data and show one of uh, the variables. I'm going to show educational attainment because that is one of the variables that I'm going to use in my online analysis. Um, so here is educational attainment. And then you see this scroll bar over here. It goes on and on for all the samples. You can filter it by sample and just choose to show a couple of samples, but um, I just wanted to show the categories. If you do a case count, you can see the number of cases and the general and the detailed codes with more details. Um, the description, I showed a little bit of this in the presentation. The comparability section lists all the countries if we click on any one country, you can see what it is for that country specifically. The universe, as you see, differs across countries and across samples. Um, here is the availability. And very quickly, the questionnaire text, um, once it loads. And then, 
we can go to any one country and see how the question is asked. Uh, remember how I showed you the paper questionnaires that we get scanned in versions. So this is how a user can access it. We can look at the text, which is a typed up text, or you can look at the image, which is the P PDF file that came from the National Statistical Office. So we're really going to go up here again and show another page, which is the sample descriptions. You can click on any sample here. I'm going to click on the first one that I see. And then you have little tabs that tell you the characters of the census. Um, I think one last thing I'm going to show you before I analyze data online is the GIS page. There are several tabs that you can explore by yourself, but the one that everyone is interested in, GIS file download. Um, these are the harmonized files at the first and second level of geography. I'm going to open one and these are zipped files that you can download, which are shapefile format, can be used in any GIS software. Uh, go back and then these are year specific first and second level geography files. And then each of these years correspond to a GIS file. So without further delay, I am going to go into the Analyze Data Online tab. tab. This is our online tabulator. And I use this a lot, uh, like just to tabulate the data before I download it to see if it is actually useful for my research or not. So this was created by statisticians at Berkeley, but it runs on our servers. Um, the data are optimized in the background to run fast tabulations. So like I said, this is really good for exploring the data. You can do some basic uh, frequencies and cross tabs and also quick trends over time and you can aggregate uh, by geographic units. Um, you have single samples like one single sample or you have all these samples like Argentina here, and then you can also go by kind of uh, continents, all of Africa, all of Asia. So data are really huge here. So I am going to go with the, the three censuses from Ghana that we have. Oops, this doesn't look very promising. Okay, so at this point, it will tell you to log in because you are actually accessing the data. Uh, so I know um, Miriam talked about the, like how you apply for access. For IFOMS International, it's like you apply for access, fill out the online form. You have to have a credible research topic because otherwise a real person actually reads it and approves you if you don't have a credible research project, we do not approve you because these data are sensitive. So I'm going to log in and this is the interface that you come up with. So fairly basic row and column. So I'm just going to do a sex in Ghana for all the three years. So here are all our variables listed. So I know sex is in demography variables. So I click here and click row. And then I'm going to leave it as weighted and run the table here. So as you can see how 
fast it is. It also sends you to a different tab. Let's see if I can. So here is my SDA window. It is putting it in a different tab. Um, you have your row, your course and weight. You have these weighted frequencies. It even gives you a graph. Uh, well, it's not very useful here, but you'll see it might get useful as we go deeper and deeper and add in more, more parameters to this. Um, so I'm going to go back to my SDA thing and do an unweighted one without doing a weight just to demonstrate how it goes. So you can see the numbers are different. These are like the numbers between the weighted and the unweighted. Uh, so I'm back to here, but just looking at sex wouldn't make much sense. So let's look at sex by the three censuses. So year is a technical variable. So I'm going to go to the technical household variables here, select year and put it in column. I'm going to get my weights back on. And run the table. So here you have a little more meat to your result. You have the sex ratio for all the three samples and you can see it change over time. You have the graphs a little more elaborate here, um, your valid cases. So we are not seeing much with the sex. So I'm going to go in and look at education primary education or secondary education. Uh, that's kind of uh, a variable that is really gives you some variation across samples and you can see the change. So remember we saw the educational attainment variable. I kind of mentioned that uh, we will be using that later for our tabulator. So here are the categories, less than primary, primary completed, secondary completed, university and unknown. So first I'm going to do educational attainment. And I could also type edu educational attainment because I know the name of the variable or you click on the education tab, select this and put it in the row. And then in the column, I'm going to go for year, which is the sample. And then let's run the table and see how it looks. So here is education across the three census years. Um, by different categories. Now here, I don't have an age filter. We usually would want to look at people 25 to 60 years old when you think that they are done like kind of going to school. So let's put some uh, filters here. So I'm going to put an age filter. Age is a demographic variable. I'm going to do that. It comes with bracket. So I'm going to type in 25 to 60. Leave the weights on. And educational attainment, I only care about the one to four categories, like category one, two, three, and four, nothing else. Uh, I don't really want the unknowns or the NIUs. Um, I am going to run the table again. And you will see these numbers are changing now. So I'm going to bring up the last one we did. Um, less than primary, 58, 50, and university uh, secondary, you see these numbers. And then if you look here, you see 
there is a drop in primary education and definitely an increase in secondary education as you add the age filter to it. Um, so I'm going to go back here and show you another option, which is you can actually download that as a CSV file. So if you click on this box here, you can say create a CSV file. You want separate statistics in multiple tables and we can see both of them and you can figure out how it looks, but I'm going to name it tables.csv, create the CSV file. And then it gives you that it has been created and then you download your CSV. So I'm gonna take a quick look at that, how it looks. Um, you have your numbers here, which are fairly usable at this time. If you combine all the statistics into one table and create your CSV file, download that, it's kind of a little complicated, I thought, but you can still work with that. Does that kind of make sense, hopefully? Um, so now to everything that uh, disaggregation by geography, and that's kind of the last thing that I'm going to show. So if we move to the means tab, and then our dependent variable we add as educational attainment. And then in our row, we disaggregate that by geography. So if you go to geography F to N, geo one, GH, and that's our row. On the column, I want year. And I also want to keep my filter of age 20 to 25. Now, educational attainment, I only care about uh, the first four categories and I'm going to make it a binary variable. Like I'm going to code, so here is what I would do. I'm going to recode it. I have this type, so I am going to just click on that, but I'll go through this. So R here stands for recode. I'm going to recode less than primary education to a, one, a zero. And then everything from two to four, which is primary education or higher to a code of one. So I am coding this to a zero and a one here. Disaggregating by geography for all the samples for the age of 25 to 60. Keeping the person weight, I'm going to display the means and then run the table. Uh, that wasn't very nice. Let's try that again. Okay. So here you have disaggregation by geography. Your graph even looks a lot nicer and usable here. And you have that. So I'm going to go back here and then you can turn off the weighted counts here. And then run the table and you get a much neater table down here that can be used. So you could play with all sorts of things. You have chart options, you have visual effects, um, whatever suits your purpose and download your CSV file. So I am going to stop here and then take any questions that we might have.
Um, I don't see any questions uh, right now, Shula, but I wanted to comment. I know um, a number of people identified themselves as in graduate school or faculty. And um, I have used the uh, tabulator, the online tabulator with IPM's websites to teach undergraduates and entering graduate students who had absolutely no training in data analysis. So um, this is something where uh, students who don't know how to use data or SPSS or R um, uh, can still frame a hypothesis and answer a question um, by you know, looking at a trend over time or comparing groups. Um, I had veterinary students who I had to explain what a variable was who ended up in my summer one week course because dairy science class was canceled. And they all wrote interesting little papers <laughs> testing a hypothesis with the um, online tabulator. And IPMS International has this, uh, IPMS DHS has this, and a lot of the IPMS USA projects have this. So um, not only can it be very useful to run some quick numbers for yourself, but it is a really great teaching tool um, when you are teaching people who have not um, yet learned uh, very sophisticated data analysis skills. So, and it looks like we may have a question. Um, yes, um, we have a, a question about list of publications where IPMS data was used, uh, listed separately by data set or application area. And I see Anna's typing an answer, but um, if you go to the IPMS website, there is a bibliography and you can search by data collection, and you can search by subject, and there are thousands of entries in there. Let me quickly show that. IPM's bibliography. All the projects that we demonstrated today should have a bibliography tab on the left side, and you are free to fill up, uh, type your project here, your data collection, and you should get an answer for that. There's also a question about um, Global Health Research Awards. Um, Miriam, uh, would you like to take that? Or I can also. Sure, I, I can take that. Um, yeah, so every year, um, IPMS um, asks people to submit uh, um, their own or a colleague's or just something that they've noticed in the field at, that they consider um, uh, uh, outstanding research that they would like to have considered for a best paper award. Um, each uh, global health um, is one of the collections where we have a best paper award for the best published paper and the best um, paper by a student author. Um, and um, this year, uh, the, the selection is closed down. We're actually submitting our winners um, to um, uh, the IFMS um, outreach group on Monday, um, but uh, it does come around every year. I encourage you to um, uh, sign up for as a as an IPMS data user and get um, on the mailing list for IPMS emails. We try not to bother you very often, but we do include important news like that. Um, there is a five hundred dollar award, I think, for the best paper, um, and also um, it's a great thing to have on your resume. You know, I was the best paper award winner. Um, for uh, an IFMS data collection. So there's one for an award for IFMS International, one for IFMS Global Health, um, one for uh, IFMS USA, for example, the US Census data. So um, um, that is a, a great thing to strive for and to enter uh, your or uh, student or colleagues work for. I just put the link in the chat. Uh, I think the call usually goes out sometime in January, um, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I think our deadline was um, like sometime in February, I believe. 
Yeah, I think it was February 18th was the deadline for submissions. Any other um, questions from the audience? Because um, after that, we have uh, one more topic to go over. Can you bring up the schedule, Devin? We can see oh, sh there. sure thing. Um, okay, it has the, the wrong. Um, section bolded, I will fix that quickly. Um, so um, we have a, a question also, um, where can I find the information on the lowest level of geography available for each data set? Um, if you go to um, the IPAMS um, website for, for each of the collections, um, you, and in the drop down menu, you will find geography as one of the topics. And if you um, look at the geography variables, um, you can see the, the level of um, detail available. Shula, do you want to add anything else to that? Sure, I can do that. Uh, I can also, uh, Tevin, can I share my screen really quick and show that? Yeah. So I can show that for IPUMS uh, International right now, and I'll show it for IPUMS DHS maybe, and IPUMS BNA. Uh, so if I go to this geography tab, list of all geography variables, you have your first level, second level, and then there are additional ones uh, here. Some of them go if it's geo three, then it's third level geography available. That's for IPUMS International, the census data project. Um, let's go to IPUMS DHS, same tab, geography and GIS, uh, integrated and your specific geography and um, you have your geography variables here. So if you like click on each one of this, it should tell you um, the codes and what the level of geography is. I'll go back to PMA. Um, okay. Uh, the same thing here, the level of geography and also the GIS files available. And then you have this listed. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Sheila. Um, Excellent. So I think um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to um, our special features. And I think I'll actually um, take that back to you, Shula, since I think you're talking about um, the, um, is it the har spatial, uh, spatially harmonized? That is a good segue to go into uh, geography. So I'm going to share screen again. So this applies to all the projects that we uh, talked about today. So what is spatially harmonized geography and how do we do it? So here is an example from Tanzania. So you have your codes and labels and across time. So let's say this is from 1988, 2002, and 2012. So like Devin gave an example of data harmonization, 
you line up all the like things together. So here we do the same thing. We line up all the like things together. But if you can see here, Mayanara, like there is no Mayanara in 1988 and all these units, they are not there. So what do you do? You can't really line up because boundaries change uh, from one year to another. So here are the census data sets that I'm listing, uh, like the colored regions are the changes in boundary. These two uh, green ones were one unit in one census year, but split into two units in the next census. Here, Arusha and Mayanara, it was one in one year and then split into two parts. And then this unit over here, but three little units in one year, but it got split into five units in another census year. So essentially, what do you do if you want to study change over time? You need to hold space constant. So we combine these two units. So here is the same example, but from the DHS project perspective, um, like 20, 1996 boundaries and 2015 boundaries and they are different. And if I look at that, the same logic, there are changes. So what we are going to do is combine these together. So now we get, when we get back to a table format, you can see Arusha was there for all the years, but Mayanara only came into existence in 2002 or a little bit before 2002. So these two have been combined together, the same here. And then the regions, the three regions, like if I go back to my first table, they were all combined here, Katawa, and because the names were the same. But here you see, even though the names are the same, their boundaries actually changed from one time period to another. So if you, again, if you are studying changes over time, like looking at um, contraceptive behavioral changes over time, then you want to use the specially harmonized geography. And that is there for DHS, for PMA. PMA, the samples are really close apart, so you don't see a lot of changes, but um, there are um, there is one country which has changes over changes of boundaries and it is combined. Mix will have the same thing, a lot more than PMA. So these are the spatially consistent boundaries. And then if you just want to study um, contraception use in women for let's say 2010, then you just want to use the year specific boundary. And you really don't need the uh, spatially harmonized boundaries. So here are boundaries from 88 to 2012. You have 25 units in 1988, which increased to 26 units and 30 units in uh, 2012. Your harmonized units, you only have 19. In terms of DHS from 1996 to 1999, we had 22 units. Um, the 2004 to 2010, you had 26 units, like corresponding to 2002 census units. And then in 2015, you had 30 units corresponding to the 2012. So if you harmonize the DHS data sets, you only get nine units because here you are taking into consideration all these units and how DHS uh, like worked with its geography. So, uh, there are two kinds of geography in all the four projects that we mentioned today. Year specific, which is sample specific, and then harmonized, which takes into consideration changes in boundaries over time. So are, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer about that now or for the remainder of the seminar, uh, but I'll pass it on to um, Devin, I think. Uh, sure, yes. Um, so I will talk just a little bit about um, 
the longitudinal data in uh, IPOM's PMA I mentioned very briefly earlier. Um, so, um, so, like I said, PMA began as a cross-sectional, a very high-frequency cross-sectional, um, but they recently refocused to um, to make a longitudinal panel of women so that the, um, it's easier to study contraceptive and fertility dynamics over the time in the same women. Um, so, uh, and what they also did in, in addition to, um, they're going to follow up with these women at least three times, uh, once per year. Uh, they also collected um, a contraceptive calendar in the baseline survey back three years. And then in the first follow-up, um, they also, I, did, I think they did about a two year contraceptive calendar. So there was some overlap so that, that you can um, do a little bit of testing about recall bias. Um, and I know that PM, the PMA team at Johns Hopkins is actually writing a paper anal uh, analyzing just that. Um, and there's, uh, but in addition to the longitudinal panel, they are um, creating, they're sampling additional households um, to keep a cross-sectional subsample. So to continue that annual um, ability to calculate annual indicators. Uh, um, and uninterrupted over time. Um, so this is uh, just a brief view of the data collection that has already happened by PMA. And so phase one is there at the baseline. Uh, so it's a little staggered. Um, and then um, there will be a phase three approximately one year after the phase two. Um, and so uh, there's a little bit of a difference in the um, IPM's PMA website now. So on the select samples screen, um, you can choose either cross-sectional or the longitudinal, and you can choose to get it in uh, long format or wide. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit, uh, but everything that I am discussing about the longitudinal panel is also available. Um, I go into more detail in a video tutorial um, and I'll also be doing a, a webinar in the future. So um, in long form, um, we're looking the uh, FQ inst ID is the linking key. So for these first two rows, this is the same woman. Um, and this is just a snapshot in Stata of her when she was first seen at age 28. And then she's seen one year later when she is 29. So that's an example of long form. Um, and then you can also request the data uh, in wide format. And notice how each of these variables, so age and marital status, um, there's an, uh, a suffix there. So underscore one means that's the baseline. Um, so that was her age and marital status at baseline. Um, and then underscore two means that that is um, her age and marital status at the first follow-up. Um, and for example, you can see uh, this woman's record she was not married uh, in the baseline and then married in uh, one year later. Um, and then notice uh, that sometimes not all the women were able to be followed up with um, the second time around and that also new women came in. So it's, it's a very complex survey design, but we have a lot of resources to explain um, how to use that. Um, and I, I wanted to conclude my little section here with uh, yet another data visualization from the uh, FM's PMA Data Analysis Hub. Um, so my colleague, Matt Gunther, created this. And what I like about this graph, so you're showing um, women in blue who are not using family planning in phase one versus phase two. And then uh, yellow is pregnant and purple is using family planning. Um, I think it's really interesting that if you had just got a cross section um, of women in phase one and phase two, you generally see that in phase two, there were um, more people using family planning than in the, in the previous round, but there's a lot more complex of a story. There's plenty of women who discontinued and also plenty of women who adopted. Uh, so it's really interesting to see like which women who were pregnant in the first period did they um, did they adopt a method or did they not? 
Uh, anyway, I think that there's just a lot of possibilities um, for the IPMS PMA longitudinal data in the future. Um, so definitely welcome you to take a look at that. Um, and then um, a little bit more about our resources. Um, so we are partnering with PNA to do a side event. Um, uh, it's a PAA workshop on April 6th, and you can still um, register for it. There's also a video tutorial about the data um, and like how to access it through our website. Um, and then there will also be um, an IPMS webinar where we're going to take a full hour to discuss um, uh, every, all the uh, intricacies about these data and, um, and analyze an example. Um, so that is it for me, and I'll pass it over uh, to Miriam to talk about contextual variables. All right. Hmm. Okay. So um, I have two topics to talk about at the end. One is contextual variables in IPMS DHS, and the other is calendar data in IPMS DHS. Contextual variables are variables that aren't based on the data that was collected in the DHS, but summary data from other sources. And many of the DHS samples have uh, information on approximately where uh, sample cluster points were, like what village um, more or less location were women sampled from. And um, these are the, the um, so they release GPS data on the approximate location of sample cluster points, like a village where women were questioned, displaced within five to 10 kilometers, um, displaced within five kilometers in urban areas or 10 kilometers in rural areas. And we use that data um, and additional outside sources and draw a five or 10 kilometer buffer zone around the reported sample cluster points with um, GIS and Shula is, and her team is responsible for that. Um, so we are able to link the DHS information about women in the sample um, by location with other information about climate or um, uh, conflict or disease environment or um, population or whatever by linking the um, GPS points um, and within this, um, this buffer zone around the reported point. Um, so we associate that non-DHS information with all the survey respondents in a sample cluster. So you know not only, for example, this woman is age 27, but you know, for example, something about the climate, the rainfall, the temperature um, in the area more or less where that woman lives. Um, these are the contextual variables currently in IFMS DHS. They cover the physical and um, environment and climate, um, especially um, precipitation and temperature um, are important if you're looking at the effect of climate events on, for example, um, uh, pregnancy outcomes or child stunting uh, early in life and so on. Um, economic and social variables like malaria rates and population density and agricultural um, information about major crops. And some of these are measured at one point in time. For example, the agricultural data is measured um, in the year 2000, and some of them are month by month or year by year um, variable, for example, for precipitation and temperature. And um, for those, we do the 60 months before the survey and 12 months after the start of the survey date. So you can uh, look, for example, at um, the effect of climate on um, children under age five and stunting and wasting and survival and birth weight and things like that. 
Um, if you want to know more about using the contextual variables in IPMS DHS, I encourage you to look at this article in the journal Population and Environment in May 2020, which Elizabeth Hager Boyle and I and others did that describes um, how we created the contextual variables, uh, what's available and how to use them. The other topic that I wanna discuss, um, I see we may have a question here. So I'm gonna quick check that. Um, okay, so uh, these are, are um, they're asking, uh, can I give an example of the non-DHS data sets you use? Are there country specific or are they international? And um, those are, are basically um, ones that are international, I believe. Um, CHIRPS, for example, is one of the climate data sets. Um, so we are the, the data that we've used is not specific to a particular country. Um, some of the data sets cover all the countries included in IPMS DHS. Some of them include a subset of countries, but they are, and if you go to the IPMS DHS website and click on the contextual variable link in the left sidebar, um, you'll see a lot of documentation, including a table that has um, the source material for the contextual variables. You can click on that and, and go back to the original sources that we used. So um, we consulted with some um, pretty eminent geographers like Catherine Grace, for example, um, to advise us on um, which data sets that are um, widely approved and accepted by an inter the international research community. Um, okay, and then I'm going to go to another topic. Hopefully, eventually. <laughs> well, having some trouble moving my PowerPoint. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing and then try again. Okay. I'm going to talk about reproductive calendar data, um, specifically in IPMS DHS, but there is similar data in IPMS PMA. So the reproductive calendar data um, is, uh, DHS is basically a cross-sectional survey, but you can get a longer term perspective through this retrospective reporting um, for women of childbearing age, where they were asked about the timing or dates of their pregnancies, their births, their pregnancy terminations, and when they use specific contraceptive methods, and often the reason that they stopped using a contraceptive method. And this is done for the period preceding the survey interview, um, usually five months before um, the interview. And if you wanna use these data, you choose woman months as the unit of analysis from that drop down menu of units of analysis when you first um, go to browse data in IPMS DHS. And this allows you to study topics such as contraceptive failure rates, uh, length of use of different methods, uh, reasons women stopped using different methods, um, prevalence of births delivered before nine months of pregnancy, relationship between something like intimate partner violence and miscarriage, um, to what extent um, stated fertility intentions at the time of the survey match past practice. Um, all of the data variables available for women and their households are also available if you choose women months as unit of analysis. So um, to what extent did women say that they wanted no more births? Um, were they actually using um, family planning in the past? Um, or not, that would be kind of an indication perhaps of, of unmet need for family planning. So there's um, a host of uh, topics that can be studied. You can use event history analysis for this. 
Um, and um, it has the advantage of, again, adding this longitudinal perspective, um, allowing event history analysis, looking at the association with women's individual characteristics. And since these data are available for 102 samples in IPAM's DHS, you can look at change over time for a country, or you can compare countries or look across multiple countries to see if the same patterns um, emerge in, in um, different countries. These data are available in the original IR women's data sets from uh, the DHS program, but they are really hard to use in the original format. Um, they appear as string variables that you have to de-string. And so we had um, an excellent R programmer um, de-string these for us and create summary variables that are much easier um, to use. There are, there's very little use of the original calendar data because they are so hard to use. And we're hoping that the easier to use format in IPAM's DHS will allow um, more people to take advantage of these data. Um, any questions about um, calendar data? No, or, or basically also any questions about anything because we've now, I believe, reached the end and thank you all for your patience and endurance. And if a question occurs to you later on after the workshop, um, please feel free to email our user support um, or put a question on the user form, because if you have a question, somebody else has probably thought of it too. we managed to pretty much stay exactly within time limits. So good for everyone for that. And um, we have nothing else to add. So I think people can go and hope you all have a good day and that this is um, ultimately helpful in your teaching and research or other work.